Welcome to The Geek in Review, the podcast focused on innovative and creative ideas in the legal profession. I'm Marlene Gaybauer. And I'm Greg Lambert. Well, for our love and tech feature this week, we have with us Michael Bomarito, who is the CEO at 273 Ventures, and Jillian Bomarito, who is the co-founder and chief risk officer at 273 Ventures. So Jillian and Michael, welcome. Thank you. Hi. Hi again. Yeah. And our first question is, uh, where, where's Foggy? Yeah. Foggy is currently roaming. He, he's in timeout for oh. bad behavior. <laughs> he's not invited to any press events. So uh, he's still alive, though. He did survive Christmas dinner because the other rooster, unfortunately, did not, thanks Ooh. to a hawk, which is a Oops. score point with the kids. But yeah. yeah. I was going to have to break the news, you guys, that Foggy was gone by a uh, matter of kind of selection process. <laughs> fate, fate saved him. Fate intervened. My goodness, because otherwise I'd be crying through the rest of this interview. So. I know <laughs> it would be it would be very sad. <laughs> if you'd met Flowers, then you really would have been sad, okay. right? Well, Dad, like Flowers. Was he, was he nicer? Was he, he was. Nicer? He was. <laughs> Every, everyone's nicer than Foggy. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> That's probably what keeps him alive. <laughs> it, it probably is. Which <sighs> I, there's a sad lesson in there. <laughs> no, one. We're trying to talk about love here. <laughs> yeah, pick that lesson. Uh, let, let's get back on track. <laughs> okay. Let's start off, you know, you both work at, at 273 Ventures, but can we expound upon that a little bit in terms of, you know, what do you both do there? Maybe discuss a little bit about what you used to do before 273? Are we doing ladies first? You probably should. <laughs> so as Greg said, I'm the chief risk officer at 273. So I get to, you know, constantly check Mike, make sure he's not doing anything that's disallowed. Keep him in line. That's a big risk. A big <laughs> nothing risk. nothing <laughs> crazy. <laughs> yeah. I know that is just a job by itself. No, but it's really nice that we do work together closely because we can kind of in real time bounce ideas off each other. And I can say, well, maybe we shouldn't do that. Or that's amazing. No one else is doing that because we're doing it the right way. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think one of the things that is inevitable when you work in a like situation like this with a spouse and also even more so when you work at a small organization like we are is the fact that you're wearing all of these different hats and you're trading hats and you're doing 55 different things and as an organization we again have like i don't know the polite way of saying is probably too much vision um so there's this just complete enmeshment of all the different things we're doing across all these different things and it really is it's fun it's engaging for the right type of people right like if you're bored by the normal corporate job and you really like to do stuff well that's kind of how we've all self-selected into this maybe relationship wise as well i guess (laughs) because uh it's not quiet right this is not not exactly the quietest situation we have yeah. So tell us a little bit about uh, before 273 or Mike, I know you've had your fingers in a lot of pies over the years. So Jill, what uh, what were you doing before this team collaboration of 273? Oh, we there have been lots of pies baked together in the uh, the Bomberito Bakery. We, um, yeah, yeah, there is actually a Bomberito Bakery as well that People always say, oh, do you know her? And I'm like, I wish I want free baked good. <laughs> so we we were together at LexPredict. We mm. have been working together for 15 years now. Wow. I'll, give, I'll give a little bit of your backstory, right? So after I left finance, I uh, like left working in uh, alternative investment. I set up my own kind of shop and shingle and... Jill was a big four tax CPA, which is a career that is a career. That's a polite way of saying it, right? You learn a lot. You do a lot. There's a lot of things about it that can be good. On the other hand, anybody who knows those three letters knows that there's certain seasonal elements or there's certain like quality of life issues. And so I had reached the point in kind of the stuff I was doing alone where we said, you know what? For the quality of life and the skills that you have and the amount of money you can make just kind of directly leveraging those skills, maybe you shouldn't work at Big Four anymore. 
I like to pyramid. I like to see daylight from you know February to April. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's go back a little further. So I, I know you guys said you worked together for fifteen years. Can you tell us about how, how you initially met? Is, is it really as a five year old? Or no, <laughs> no. We um. I know Mike looks like he was five fifteen years ago. Not anymore. But, man. <laughs> no, we um. We met in high school, and honestly, my first impression of him probably still holds true today. He was kind of smarter than everybody else and was not afraid to correct the teacher, which I thought was obnoxious. And it was. <laughs> it still is, but it's also, it turns out he was kind of right. And um, some of those characteristics have grown on me. Some I will say I'm still just as, you know, we all, we all have flaws. We all have personality. We all have personalities, yeah. Some more bearable and less bearable than others, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it turns out that that first impression has pretty much h- held true. Yeah. So, did you have the same class? Is that how you met, or just you know, was it just sort of you know different um, activities or? Yeah, how we did you guys had connect? a class together, and uh, it's like AP Gov, right? Yeah, yeah, we had AP Gov, which is kind of funny to think about now, circling back to. Laws and rules. rules. Yeah. Full circle, <laughs> I guess, right. We never really thought about that. Yeah. So everything seems like such happenstance at some point in retrospect, right? But like, yeah, it's, it's all the way back to high school. And and then I don't know what constitutes growing up at some point, right? It's like uh, a standard I have yet to meet is probably the most honest way of describing it. But like we have grown in whatever sense together for a while now. So it's weird to kind of think about the before there is a before it i'm it's there i remember it but like mm-hmm. it's not really perceived in the same way as like thinking about before we were together or whatever yeah it almost doesn't seem real because you're at a different stage right now right a stage i never would have expected if you had told me then that we would be on our fourth business together so after after high school did you guys stay in touch did, uh, how how the relationship progress after that well we started dating in high school, and then Jill went to a different college, and then transferred back, and then I mean it's it's really been continuous like that. So it's it's weird. I know they don't they don't make a lot of stories like that anymore, as they say. So that's true. It sounds stranger now than it than obviously it once was. But I mean, you know, it, um, you don't. It's really that simple. So yeah, high school sweethearts. You know, that's. That's, you're right. It doesn't, you don't usually hear that anymore. So, and, and to be fair, I don't think anybody would allege in any standing or with any type of faith that we're sweet. So, hey, not- <laughs> <laughs> tell him to speak for himself. Yeah, right. right? <laughs> there we go. And, and just so uh, we know for the audience, because we're probably going to hear more of this, I think you have a couple of children that may be in the, in the background running around. Yeah. <laughs> three little rascals three. So, oh wow yeah. hence hence, you, hence we are off video <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> so, yeah so here's my only relationship advice for couples is if you have three children they outnumber you so just remember that yeah did you know that so going if in? we blink twice <laughs> i know that you guys can see us even if the people listening can't if we blink twice send help the children have taken over <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my 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 advice was always like cargo pants like that was always my advice <laughs> for exactly yeah. all all on your person well like the uh the fanny packs and stuff are back now too that's right true so, like, that's, that's uh, true yes that's acceptable now totally acceptable very stylish mm-hmm. what do you both think has been the, the best thing about you know sort of being in the same professional space and in the in the same organization uh, I mean, people talk about management, theories of management, like management <laughs> cultures. So romantic. I know. Well, I, mean, like, I did not we'll, expect we'll get them to start with it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. And so many of the adjectives or words that people use in those like theories and cultures of management are words that are family words, but they're never actually true, right? Mm-hmm. This is actually just that. So it truly is family. Sense, all the things people have to try to pretend to do this is the cynical version of it 
from a management culture perspective is just like the way it is. Yeah. It's that easy. Again, it's like stupid, simple in some sense, but it's kind of just true. Yeah. At the end of every day, we live together. We have to figure stuff out. We disagree. We already disagreed like any family. We have to communicate because you don't stay a family if you don't communicate. And so you just do all those things and it's no different. Yeah. Well, she didn't hear any of that. So Jill didn't hear any of that because she ran off to go take care of one of the kids. So we're going to now see what Jill has to say with this. This is almost like the old newlywed game where you couldn't, you didn't know what yeah, the yeah, yeah. answer was. <laughs> well, so, I like that idea. So Jill, what do you think is uh, the best thing about being in, in the same profession? It's kind of a double-edged sword because I feel like the parts that are the best are also the worst. Like we are constantly in each other's business. We always kind of know what the other person's working on. And personally within our household, we know what's going on. So the great part is that you can kind of pick up like right now when we're on conference calls and there's a kid who's homesick, we can take turns dealing with that because we know that we need to we're both working towards the same thing, both professionally and for our family. You know, at the same time, we're both doing the same thing. There's not really any boundaries between work and home because when one of us is doing it, the other one kind of has in the back of their mind, you know, what they're working on. And it's it's good for getting things done. It's not great for you know, a good work-life balance. Yeah. And I mean, with Mike, like, he I, never stops. That was like, so. that's the thing is like, as I alluded to earlier, it's kind of like you, you knew what you were getting into from the start. And so if you wanted a, a kickback and do nothing life, well, you you picked their own husband a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and our kids have his energy levels. There's a lot of enthusiasm in the household. Yeah. And I was going to say with, with uh, and I know a lot of couples have talked about especially starting businesses during the lockdown period of the, of the pandemic. There were some rewards, but also some challenges. So what's been some of the challenges that you guys have had to had to face, you know, over the past few years, I would say. Honestly, I kind of feel like we had worked it all out before because we have both been working from home together for so long that. That wasn't a big change. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't really change much, honestly. Another non-answer is funny. Like, maybe one of the more salient and relevant accounts is in like 2017 or 18 at Lex Predict, we got an ISO 27001. And at the time, we were like a distributed remote team, which was not very well contemplated by something like our auditors in the controls and the standard. They were used to going to the offices, checking things out, not your whole team works from home, from their houses. Um, hmm. now that's more common. That's more standard. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like we had built our whole, like our last businesses around that kind of framework. And so, yeah, it's like we were in that very well situated to adapt to COVID. It was essentially no change for us. Made it easy. Yeah. You guys, yep. you guys were ahead of the curve. So. I guess. <laughs> right. Something. We were something, but we were at least well prepared in this instance. You know, we've been asking all our, our couples this, and we always get some really fun responses, but like, what is the kind of reaction you get when, you know, you tell others that you work, you know, for the same company? I mean, do people know for the most part in, in the legal tech community, or is, is it something that most people don't know? I'll speak for Jill for a second and just say one word, sympathy. This is what I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> the short thought. So. so after the sympathy, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, usually the response I get if people don't know is, wow, really? <laughs> How do you do that? Why do you do that? <laughs> I think for a lot of people, it either they know that it wouldn't work for them, so they haven't gone down that path, or they have gone down that path. And the ones you're you're talking to, clearly, it's worked. I'm kind of surprised. Like, again, like I said earlier, I never would have imagined this is where I would be and what I would be doing, but it works so well. Like, you know, your coworkers drive you crazy. Your partner drives you crazy. We just, 
we're efficient. We combine the two and, you know, you can just <laughs> drive me crazy the one time. Yeah. <laughs> I can't complain about my coworker to him, though. That's true. I guess I yeah. could complain about the rest of our team, yeah. but it works really well. But most people don't understand how we do this without going crazy. Yeah. Do, I mean, do you think it might have something to do with the fact that, I mean, you guys have been a couple for a very long time and sort of pre yeah. all of this. And do you think that yeah. that has an impact? I do. I think that we've, we've basically grown up together. We've grown into who we are as adult living shared experiences, both personally and building a business, selling a business, starting another business. Like we have all that background that we've shared, that we've learned from and said, okay, well, this time we're going to do X, Y, Z. ABC worked really well. Let's do that again. Yeah. It's longitudinal, right? Like both the personal experiential stuff is longitudinal and then the business stuff is longitudinal, right? So it's like all that stupid MBA kind of stuff, but like actually for real here in terms of like transfer of knowledge and enterprise and culture and port codes and private equity or are, are, are like, the children the port codes i don't know maybe <laughs> right it's like it's generational generational yeah. leverage it's uh it's like the crevasse pyramid here except we don't have them billing yet is that where you're going we could do we have a family them. farm that we could operate them under at uh different minor yep well um each restrictions so there's a lot of flexibility we have here. i think it's 11 <laughs> Oh, okay. That's right. for the dangerous equipment, but I don't, uh, they don't. The boys want to get on the tractor already, got it, so got it. I don't know if I can hold them off to eleven, no matter what. Yeah, that is true. So, well, let me shift gears a little bit and talk. Uh, and and I think this probably goes across both the personal and the business side of things. Working close together, there's you know there's got to be some things that you don't necessarily agree one hundred percent with each other on how to go forward. What do you do to to successfully manage a situation where you may not agree on how to proceed with some change that you want to do? I get my way. There we go. <laughs> Just get that. Uh, that's when it's, you pull out the CRO card and it's like, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, the blessing and curse of all of this, right, is that you end up in a lot of these Socratic situations where there's a lot of consensus but it in across the team right like even with dan cats too like all of us will be on these calls and we're just kind of used to debating and arguing in that socratic style in a lot of ways and that's how decision making i mean he, works. he's and, been he's been part of the relationship for a long time yeah, for like guys... 11 years right too so like yeah. there's just there's a lot of this longitude and so you're like to say that we are um we just basically get on the phone or get in person and and talk and yell and argue about all this stuff, just like families, yeah. is basically what we do. And here's Jill trying to uh, right. Jill's trying to silence slack. So ah. this, uh, this is like again to that point, That's constantly right. talking with each other yes. on this stuff. Well, and and Dan's wife is part of the company as well, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It really has some of those elements of like the traditional family business. Other than we're not importing Parmesan or something like that, right? <laughs> we're like trying to build large language models and agents and legal and all this stuff. So okay. It has many similarities and then some rather notable I was going to say no Parmesan on the farm. I mean, no. Mike is also just mad because after we sold Lex, he wanted to buy water buffalo and start a it was before that. business. It was, was before it? That. it was like much before that, okay. actually. Yeah. It just resurged. No, I've always wanted that. Like, Buffalo mozzarella, water buffalo herd, like that was what I want to do, really. So, like all this AI and legal stuff is whatever. That's my. It, it, you're just you're just marking time until you can get the that uh, herd of water buffalo. Yeah. And, okay. And for the record, here this is Damien who won't stop talking. Hi, Damien. When are you on this next? <laughs> well i gotta say it's, it's like i'm pretty high on seaweed farms like i think that's i think those are great so yeah that's my thing if you're up in uh canada bay of fundy yeah yeah get up there next okay do they have a bunch yeah there? yeah this next time good to know so. all right i don't know i feel it like... i assume... go ahead go ahead sorry sorry i was gonna say i assume you have to cut like 95 percent of what mike said 
nope, nope. we're keeping it all in. <laughs> I know that's the fun part, right? It's like yeah. you, you don't get people who are uh, well. You know what temperatures are in language models. This is like one of the, yeah. the family jokes now, right? It's like I'm like when you dial the temperature up a little bit too high. Like I'm that model, and yep. I'm the moderation layer struggling to keep up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, at least you're not speaking Spanish like uh, Chat GPT did earlier this week. Got stuck this so. week, yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, I don't know. It happens to the best of us after a couple of drinks, I guess. But true. they're supposed to have a little bit more reliable deployment strategy than that, aren't they? That's <laughs> true. Uh, so now we we talked a lot about how you guys balance the the lives. Well, let let me actually peer one thing in in there because we had this with uh, Chris Ford and Nikki Shaver was talking about if they have to travel because they have children there's an issue with you know child care with having three kids are you guys i know you work from home but if you have to go somewhere and you both have to go to the same thing throw them in the airstream there we go all right we should uh give that as a suggestion to chris and nikki Mm -hmm. You know, in I, New York, uh, it's probably New bigger York. than their New York apartment. Yeah, I was going to say the twenty-five footer would cost a uh, pretty penny to store in the city. Yeah, yeah but take true. it across the bridge. I don't think you can take it through the tunnel. Tunnels don't allow mm-hmm. trailers that wide. Yeah. Anyway, well, I'll ask her next time. <laughs> I talk park it. Park direction. it under the GW. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, here's the question that, I, that I've been anxious to ask, and, and it's not so much about. Uh, uh, the couple, but more about what you guys are working on together. Michael, I've been watching you post things on LinkedIn and other places where you're doing some really interesting things with the Kelvin large language model that uh, you guys have developed. That's, I think you're calling it like a, a clean data model. Very interesting. So um, you guys tell us a little bit about some of the cool things that, that you're playing with now. Sure. I mean, this is actually about the couple thing, too. I'll work it all here together. So right. Jill is one of the world's first certified AI auditors like two years ago. Explain that. Yeah. What does that mean? So, um, yeah, I guess it was two years, two years ago. I saw... Um, AI didn't exist two years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> At least for most AI experts, it didn't exist until yeah. November of 22, right? Um, exactly. I saw an organization that was starting a essentially an AI audit regimes. At this point, their body of knowledge is very immense. It's called For Humanity. And the idea was establishing an audit regime for auditing AI systems. And they go through different definitions and stuff in terms of bias, in terms of explainability. What else did... I mean, it's like it's like an audit standard, yeah. right? It's like there's a whole bunch of stuff you're supposed to go through and collect evidence and then eventually attest to or not on this. It was weird at the time because you were in this backwater where not a lot of people understood AI and then audits this really boring thing. And then like now you're going to... Coming from tax, it. I'm used to people being bored by what I do. I was going to say that it, it sounds like it dovetailed nicely to your, your big four work, right? Yeah. You know, thinking about compliance and risk generally, this kind of fit nicely into it. And I I went into it thinking not necessarily that I was going to start doing these audits, but just for my own understanding to have a way of knowing that what we're building now, that we're kind of doing things the right way and that we are documenting things so that we do have that explainability for why we've made decisions in how we've trained the model, the data that we've used, all of those kinds of things that often don't get thought about kind of across multiple areas. They're usually very siloed in the technical team. Maybe legal takes a review of things. Too late, apparently, lately we're seeing. Yeah, at some point in time. So kind of like Mike was saying, this really is the couple thing. My background with sort of the risks from a compliance perspective and from a contractual perspective, doing all the deep dives in what's allowed under the different models that are out there, what's covered for indemnification and stuff. And that's a whole different, Mm. it's a whole different path that I won't even go down. But all of that has really, I think, worked nicely with what Mike's been developing because at every single step along the way, we can stop and have conversations about the decisions that were being made and it's a really conscious, purposeful decision that we're making about how. 
And that's basically the differentiation in some senses, because I guarantee you, none of the other major model providers started with that mentality in the room. And that's like kind of the problem that we're seeing evidenced in a lot of the litigation or the issues that show up in public fora is there was a technical team that did a lot of really hard technical work. And then a couple of years later, when these things kicked off commercially and people started to care about what came out the other end of those generations, somebody said, hey, that looks like a toxic or copyrighted or hallucinated generation can we fix that and then you're like all of these sins of technical choices and data and all well they accumulated and there's a cost to going back and Mm -hmm. you know that reminds me i I was listening to a podcast this morning that was talking with the ceo of google's deep mind division and one of the things that that he pointed out was there's and and he really kind of i think placed it into two camps and that was there's the startup mentality of break things and you know and, and move on. He was saying that his model was better because they're using more of a scientific model yeah. to to do things. But it sounds like there may be a third way on it with this kind of audit structure that you're talking about. Am I am I kind of looking at that in, in the yeah, right like, way? like an ethical like no. an ethical build. Yeah, and and it's almost like Ethics is complicated, right? There isn't a single ethical or normative framework because moral relativism and people and federalism evidence is that anyway, right? So like leave the global ethical thing aside. There's just kind of like the lawful or legal version of this, which is if you follow the contracts and you follow the statutes, what would you do or not do? And in some cases, like one of the things that I know everybody kind of is seeing, Google's made some choices, and those choices are, are probably going to be the right choices on average over the next decade, given policy. Maybe they messed up something on the edge of it here or there to start. But like these general purpose models are going to need to be acceptable for public use. On the other hand, if I'm taking a law and a rule and I'm building a model, you do not want me touching that. Right. Like you don't want me debiasing a model by changing names and genders and stuff in the laws and rules. They need to be entered unadulterated. Whereas what DeepMind and Google are doing with building a model that's maybe more fair or whatever is hopefully going to work out better than their first release. And that is probably what is needed for policy if AI is going to be allowed Mm. writ large in the legal domain. We need to not touch the training data. The training data is the law. The model provider should not be messing with that. And if the model provider is selling a model to a law firm, well, it probably shouldn't be infringing on third-party rights because that's generally frowned upon. So like, if you just follow the contract, the average software license agreement, the reps and warranties in the back of that agreement, and you say, build a model where you can actually knowingly sign this thing, and not worry about the indemnification or liability provisions. I mean, that's what we've done. Yeah. Now we talked a lot about what, what the cool stuff that uh, Jill's doing. Mike, I saw some interaction with uh, uh, contracts in Word. I've seen uh, a reference to uh, the banana. Uh, but arrested sales development from arrested yeah. development. Yeah. Um, so, so what are what are some things that you're doing with the LLM that you're finding? very interesting right now i mean all of that kind of right is like we're all at this this tip of this like we are at least our organization's kind of the tip of the spear of what you can do with these things and obviously we're trying to bring things to market that are useful for people and so some of what we've been showing lately is like normal agreements that everybody has doing normal diligence checklists here's a million words in a deal room go find the employee who's got a bonus that's different than the others very run-of-the-mill stuff. On the other hand, there's a version of that where you imagine, well, what if the agent, what we're calling kind of this like autonomous party or actor, was able to figure out the checklist from scratch and to go through the whole deal room and draft the memo, the diligence report about the risks, and then like maybe propose uh, revisions to the SPA based on the risks in the memo it found. I don't think anybody's ready for that, clearly from a cost plus billable model. Nobody's ready to sell that downstream because that has pretty clear implications for associates and stuff like that at the bottom of the pyramid. But that's like the stuff I'm excited about now, in addition to just the idea that we can build a large language model that runs on a laptop 
That is yeah. from a pure technical perspective. I think about as a kid when I first like wrote a Fortran two layer neural network. I don't know. It all seems unreal when you back up for a second and think about it. Yeah. Is that Damien still uh, coming through on? No, Slack? it's it's one of our interns <laughs> who's working on more training data to teach our model to do cool stuff. <laughs> yep. I can't. We can't. We can't see anything. We're be on video can't back see. here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, while well, Michael's taking care of uh, the, the sick baby. Yeah. Um, he just wanted more French fries. He must be feeling better. Okay. That's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> no, wanting food is a, is a definite sign. So, yeah. Yep. Well, 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 I know you guys uh, have to deal with some stuff over there. So we'll kind of wrap it up <laughs> with the, like we, <laughs> we normally have our crystal ball question, but we're calling this our Valentine question. What advice would you give another couple who are considering, you know, working in the same field or working together in the same business? And maybe, maybe, I don't know. No, no I'm not. I don't, know, I, I don't, I don't even know who to start with. I don't think there's the answer. I might give some hard advice, which is don't do it unless you really think you can. That's like, that that's the fair. truth of it, right? Is And the only way you probably know if you can is if you spend time together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's not like an easy answer because it just means wait if you haven't spent a long time together. Yeah. But that is probably my advice. It, that, that reminds me of Sonia Ebron. Sonia had said, you know, don't do it just because you like each other. Do it because there's a, a real solid reason to build that uh, business. It. So it yeah. sounds like that's kind of in line with that. So, uh, Jill, uh, any any advice you have for a couple of, for a couple that would come up to you and ask? Honestly, I feel like if back to the newlywed game, I would have held up the same card. It's a very all-consuming thing to do because some of the biggest aspects of your life are together, commingled, and. It, if you do want to do it and you go into it kind of like Mike said, knowing what you're getting into, it's been amazing for us. I'm really thankful that we've been able to do this. And I think it's been really cool for our kids to see us doing this, you know, building companies together and working together to move forward. And, you know, like we talked about earlier to solve problems that come up. It's kind of like just finding a business partner in general. Like you don't know if your co-founder is going to be the right fit unless you really know them. Mm. And in a lot of cases, I think people don't necessarily have the, I guess the, like they're not lucky enough to be able to have that person be their partner, partner in life, partner in business. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> it's like the worst tagline. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry for that. <laughs> but if you can find somebody who you can do that, it's it can be a really, really rewarding experience. Yeah. All right. Well, Michael and Jillian Bomarito of two seventy three ventures, and I'm sure the uh soon to be upcoming Buffalo Mozzarella company. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> if Mike has his way. <laughs> well, I want to thank both of you for taking the time to come on the Geek and Review and share your love and legal tech story. So thank you. Thanks thank so you much. Bye bye. And of course, thanks to all of you, our listeners, for taking the time to listen to the Geek and Review podcast. If you enjoy the show, share it with a colleague. We'd love to hear from you, so reach out to us on social media. I can be found on LinkedIn or on X at Gay Bauer M and on Threads at mgaybauer 66 and I can be reached on LinkedIn or on X at Glambert and Threads. You can reach out to me at Glambert Pod. Uh, Jillian and Michael, uh, if people want to learn more about 273 Ventures and, and the the two of you, what, where should they go? I don't know. Don't <laughs> reach out to us, right? But 273ventures.com or it's probably easiest to get us on LinkedIn these days. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just have to take a screenshot of, uh, of Jill's reaction to that. Yeah, Jill, Jill, Jill do you want do you want to give the answer? <laughs> I mean, I think if you're talking about your company, maybe the answer shouldn't be "Don't talk to us." <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, two seventy three ventures dot com and Kelvin dot legal, and on LinkedIn, you can see Mike's hijinks and my risk assessments of things nice very good and uh the custom composed love and legal tech music that you hear for this series is from jerry david DeSica and eve Searles. thank you both yeah thanks jerry and eve all right thanks everybody
Thank you, guys. Thank you. Love and